To kick things off, let's start with the legs. <laughs> Get it? Kick, kick things off? Legs? <clears throat> to design this leg rig to be effective, we need to think about what the most convenient way to animate a walk is. Or at least, what would be the least inconvenient way. To get the thinking started, let's find out what would happen if we rigged a leg as just a couple of bones that are the children of the body. Add an armature to the scene. Switch to side view and go into edit mode. Right now, we're just playing around. We're playing with ideas. The point of this is to just be free, with nothing considered sacred or final. This is our playground for problem solving. Our problem solving playground. So let's say that the default bone represents the body of the character. And let's add two more bones to represent a leg. Position them to be like the upper and lower parts of the leg. Now let's make the upper leg the child of the body. And let's make the lower leg the child of the upper leg. But in this case, instead of choosing keep offset, like we usually do, let's, let's select connected and see what happens. How odd, the lower leg moved. Its top endpoint now lines up exactly with the upper leg's bottom endpoint. In fact, if we try to select this endpoint and move it, they both move together. The two endpoints are now merged into one. And this is what the connected item in the bone parenting menu means. When you connect bones together like this, they're called a bone chain. You can also quite easily create bone chains by selecting an endpoint and pressing the E key. This extrudes a new bone from that endpoint, which is a connected child of the bone you extruded from. To confirm, left click. You can continue hitting E and left clicking to extend the bone chain further and further. If we go into pose mode now, we can see that the translation transforms are grayed out. This is because you cannot translate bones that are connected to their parent. You can only rotate and scale them. But they do move, of course, if you rotate or move their parents. This connected feature is really just for our convenience as riggers, and it doesn't really enable anything special. We could manually line up the bones endpoints and lock their location transforms to get pretty much the same effect. But there are a lot of cases where you want these sorts of chains of bones, and this connected child feature, it just makes it a lot easier for us to manage. Let's go back into edit mode and delete all the bones except the body and leg bones. Now to test this simple leg rig that we've just created, let's go back into pose mode. <laughs> and, and if you think this is a lot of mode switching, you have no idea what you're getting into. There will be so much more mode switching as we get into more complex rigging. So let's say that we're going to animate a walk with this. Never mind that there's only one leg. Pretend, pretend there's another one. Use your imagination. A common similarity between all walks is that at some point in time, a foot is going to be on the ground, and it will remain relatively stationary while it's there. It's also a common similarity that during this time, the body is going to continue moving forward, because, you know, walking makes you move forward. So the question now is, is this easy to accomplish with this rig? Let's try. Mark where the foot is supposed to be with an empty. Now move the body forward. Hmm. Okay, well, now we need to adjust the leg to keep the foot in place. Okay, now move the body forward again. And now we need to adjust the foot again. Hmm. Well, this is kind of tedious. Plus, what if we were actually animating this, and we decided we wanted to subtly adjust how the body was moving forward? Then we would have to redo all of the leg positions again. Ah, that sucks. So hopefully you can see that this is a pretty terrible solution for a walking leg rig. What we really want is a way for us to be able to make the foot stay put, and make the body move forward, all while the leg automatically stays properly attached to both. As it turns out, there is a great way to do this, and it's called inverse kinematics. Inverse kinematics, in its simplest form, is a way to instruct a bone chain to try really hard to keep its tip connected to something else, without moving its base. Sometimes this is impossible. For example, if 
that something else is too far away or too close. But it tries really hard. In this case, we can use inverse kinematics to tell our leg to stay connected to the foot whenever possible. To do this though, we first need a foot bone. So let's add another bone near the end of the leg to represent the foot. We also need to make sure that the knee is slightly bent in edit mode, so do that if you haven't already. I'll explain why that's important in a later section of the DVD, but in a nutshell, it's going to tell the inverse kinematics solver which direction the knee should bend. Now we need to add the inverse kinematics. In Blender, inverse kinematics is considered a constraint, although eh, it actually operates outside of the constraint system to an extent, but I'll explain that later when I discuss how the constraint stack functions. But for now, let's keep it simple. Inverse kinematics is the first constraint we're going to use that involves one bone affecting another bone. Remember that there are two ways to add constraints. Via the constraints panel or bone constraints panel, and via a hotkey in the 3D view. To add the inverse kinematics constraint via the bone constraints panel, we need to select the last bone in the chain, because even though the constraint will affect both bones, IK constraints always exist on the last bone we want affected in the chain. Now add the constraint via the menu. Inverse kinematics requires a target for the bone chain to attempt to stay connected to. If we don't specify one, the IK constraint has no goal, and it won't really do anything. In this case, we want it to stay connected to the foot, so the foot is our target. Click on the target field in the IK constraint. Just like with driver variables, we first have to specify the armature object, and then the bone name. So specify the armature in the first field. Now we can specify the bone in the bone field. Oh my. Which of these is a foot bone? They're all just named bone, with a number pendant on the end. We really need to name these bones, so let's do that before we move on. Whew, okay, much better. This is one of the reasons it's important to name things in our rigs. It makes things less confusing, not only for other people that look at the rig later, but it also makes things a lot less confusing for us. Okay, now let's specify the foot in the bone field. Wow, it just immediately snapped to connect with the foot bone. But before we move on, let's see how to add this using a hotkey. To add a constraint where one bone affects another, you first select the bone that will do the affecting, and then you select the bone that will be affected. This is kind of the reverse of specifying parents, which can make this confusing and hard to remember. Unfortunately, we just need to put up with that. Next, hit Control shift c and select Inverse Kinematics. Ta-da! Now we have an IK constraint with all the target information filled out for us. This is a much faster way to add constraints, and it's the way that I usually do it. Now let's try moving the foot bone around. <laughs> Nifty. The leg stays connected to it. However, notice that the body bone is moving too. How strange. It's not part of the leg's bone chain. The reason this happens is because inverse kinematics actually isn't limited to just bone chains. It actually functions on any parent-child hierarchy of bones. It will keep searching up the hierarchy, parent to grandparent to great-grandparent, until it can't find any more bones. To limit the constraint to the leg bones, we need to specify a limit on how far up the hierarchy it searches. And thankfully, this is extremely simple to do. We just change the chain length. Zero, the default value, is a magic number for this field, and it means unlimited. But any other number, such as, for example, two, tells it that we only want it to affect, in that case, two bones up the chain. And since we only have two leg bones, that is indeed the number that we want. Now when we move the foot, only the leg bones move. Yay! Also, if we move the body, the leg sticks too. Woohoo! So IK, or inverse kinematics, seems pretty magical. And in a lot of ways it is. But we're still going to run into some problems with it if we just leave it how it is right now. And that's because inverse kinematics is an under-constrained problem. What on earth do I mean by that? 
Well, to start with, I'm not talking about Blender's constraint system. I'm using the word constrained in a different sense now. In this case, when I say that inverse kinematics is solving an under-constrained problem, I mean that there are multiple possible solutions. If we have a two-bone chain, and a point that we want it to reach, there are actually multiple solutions. It could bend this way, or it could bend that way. And in 3D space, the bones can twist and rotate around every which way. In fact, there's an infinite number of solutions to this problem. And it only gets worse if we have more than two bones. Then even when restricted in 2D space, there are still an infinite number of solutions. That's what I mean when I say that IK is an under-constrained problem. The IK solver has a lot of wiggle room to choose its solution from. Now, in a lot of cases, this simply doesn't matter. Blender's IK solver does a pretty good job of finding smooth, sensible solutions to the problem. But in this case, we really do care about the specific solution. In particular, Nizan bipedal creatures only bend on one axis, and Mr. Squeegee Feet is no different. Unfortunately, the IK solver doesn't care about that, and it will bend the shin bone in any direction it likes. Fortunately, we can tell the IK solver to care. Select the shin bone, and go to the bone properties. Find the inverse kinematics panel, and toggle it open if necessary. There are a bunch of parameters in here, all of which allow us to configure how the IK solver uses this bone. In this case, what we care about are these toggles with the lock icons. These allow us to tell the IK solver not to rotate on these axes. It's just like locking rotation axes for manual rotation in the 3D view, except this is for the inverse kinematics solver. We want the knee to only bend on one axis. But which axis? Let's go find out. We can't very easily rotate the shin bone right now, because its rotation is controlled by the IK constraints. But I have a new trick to show you that will let us figure out the bone's axes without rotating anything. Go to the armature properties and find the display panel. There's a checkbox labeled axes. Click it. Aha! Suddenly, there are weird arrows sticking out of our bones with letters attached. Let's take a closer look. These are visualizations of the bone's axes. For rotations, the bone will rotate around the axes, so we can see then that the axis we want the knee to bend on is the x-axis. Return to the bone's IK properties and lock the other two axes. Now when we move the foot, the knee only bends on the x-axis. Woohoo! Because of the length of my explanations, this may already seem really complex, but let's take a look at what we've actually done so far. We've added a two-bone chain for the leg, we've added an IK constraint to make the leg stick to the foot, we've told the IK to only affect the leg bones, and we've told the IK solver to only bend the knee on one axis. So we really haven't actually done that much yet, and it's not really so complex. I'm just long-winded. <laughs> Sorry. But we do still have one last step before this is a finished leg rig, and that is to give the animator control over what direction the knee is pointing. Right now, the knee direction is pretty much up to the IK solver. It will generally point in the right direction, for reasons that I'll explain when we look at IK more in depth. But there are still situations where the animator will need direct control, for example if they are animating an old man with wobbly knees. There are a couple of ways to do this, but my favorite for bipedal characters is called a pull target. To explain how a pull target works, imagine that we drew a straight line between the base of an IK bone chain and that chain's target. If we rotate the entire bone chain around that line, as if the line were an axis, the bone chain would still reach the target exactly, no matter how we spun it around that line. What a pull target does is it limits that part of the solution. It's a secondary target that tells the IK bone chain how to orient itself around that line. Let's dive in and try it out. Go into edit mode and add another bone in front of the leg. Name it pull target. Now go to the leg's IK constraint and specify that bone as the pull target. Remember that just like everywhere else that you specify a bone, you need to specify the armature first. You'll notice that immediately the leg rotates to <laughs> kind of an odd angle. This is because the pull target is forcing it to spin into that position. If we switch to a top view, 
and move the pole target around, we can see that the leg spins around exactly as much as we move the pole target around it. The basic idea is that if you imagine a line connecting the leg to the pole target, the angle of that line determines the spin of the leg. Of course, having the knee point off to the side of the pole target isn't very intuitive for animators. It would be much better if the knee pointed at the target. Fortunately, this is easy to adjust. Go to the IK constraint again, and find the field labeled Pole Angle. We can adjust the offset from the pole target here. Much better. Now the knee points at the pole target. Something important to notice about the pole target is that if we switch to the side view again, and move it up and down, it doesn't do anything. This is because the only thing that matters about the pole target is its position around the line, not the position along it. I find the easiest way to think about this is to look straight down the line, the line between the base of the bone chain and the IK target. Only the motion of the pole target on this view plane matters. Now, if we move the foot, that line moves. And the plane of motion that matters moves too. We can move the pole target huge distances along that line, and it doesn't affect anything. Only the position around the line matters. Now, one last thing to do is make the pole target the child of the foot. That may seem kind of weird, but it makes things a little bit more convenient, since feet and knees usually point in roughly the same direction along the IK line. This way the animator can better ignore the pole targets when they don't need to do anything special. Now that we have the pole target set up, we're finished designing the leg rig. Hooray! We can move the foot, and we can move the body, and control where the knee is pointing. This leg rig design is called an IK leg, because it is designed entirely around inverse kinematics. By contrast, our first attempt at a leg rig, where we manually rotated the leg joints, is called an FK, or Forward Kinematics Leg Rig. Put simply, forward kinematics is when you rotate a bone chain joint by joint, whereas an inverse kinematics rig is a rig like the one we just created, where the rotations of the bones are automatically calculated based on a desired target. Both kinds of rigs are useful for different situations, and later on we'll learn how to build a rig that lets us do both. But for now, we're going to leave it as is because we know we're only going to use this rig for walking, so we don't need FK.